The last video showed us that a computer program is actually made up of a number of sub-programs. And with respect to operating systems, a program is regarded as an inactive unit. In other words, the machine code for it is available in the computer's random access memory, but it's not being fetched, decoded, and executed. And of course, within the operating circles, we often refer to a program as a job. And refer back to the previous video if you're unsure on any of this. But of course, when we take an individual sub-program, and when it is executing, a sub-program when executing is a process. If we consider jobs for a moment, we can say that jobs will join queues in operating systems. And essentially, the principle behind this is as follows. The user wants to start off a particular job, so they click on an icon. They then click on another icon to start a different job. So it could be Word, it could be a spreadsheet, and so on. And what will happen, a job is added to a queue, another job is added to a queue, and then the third job is added to a queue. And I think what we need to realise here, these are the concepts behind operating systems, the adding of things to queues, to be actually acted upon by the operating system at appropriate time when it becomes their turn to be acted upon. Now, if we consider these jobs to be in a queue, as you can see here, they are regarded as being in a hold state. Now, appropriate operating system policies will select one of the jobs to be admitted into what's called the ready state. So we will see that occurring here, where we are saying we'll take a job and we'll admit it to the ready state. Now, the part of the process manager responsible for this is something referred to as the job scheduler. What we need to do is to ask some questions. And one of the questions we need to ask, is there sufficient memory? Because remember, in the ready state, we're not executing anything. We're not fetch, decode, and executing the process. That's part of the job that's been moved into this state. What we now need to do is to possibly move it into the computer's memory. But we would need to ask, is there sufficient memory? Now, we've already seen that managers cooperate with each other. If there isn't sufficient memory, what needs to happen is the process manager would have to communicate with the memory manager and say, could you free up some space, please, because I wish to load this process into the computer's memory so it could be fetched to code and executed. Another consideration is, is there a need to access devices? These are questions that could be asked because the process manager could then communicate with the device manager to see if the devices are free to be used, for example. The ready state will work with a queue, and this particular queue is shown here. And I wish to stress that this is a queue of some data structures that are related to processes that are actually in the random access memory. Because remember, you fetch, decode, and execute the machine code from random access memory. What we have got here is a ready-to-run queue of data structures. Now, these data structures contain information about the processes that exist in the memory. These are not the actual machine code for those processes. They're a queue of data structures. And in fact, they're a queue of what are called process control blocks. And if we have come from the whole state to the ready state with a particular job, we have to realize that this will be added to this particular queue. Now, policies will be in place that decide which of the processes that this queue references in memory will move into the next state. But here what we need to realize is what we have here are policies that will decide where things are also placed upon this particular queue. And when we look at what an individual process control block is, we can see it is here and it's made up of a number of things. It's made up of a process ID, a process state, which consists of process status word, and it has some accounting information. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to talk very briefly about each of these that appear in the data structure. But to stress, this is a data structure. It's not the actual machine code for the process. It's not something that we're going to be fetched, decode, executed. This holds information on the actual process, which will be fetched, decoded, and executed. Let's consider each field of this data structure, i.e. each field of the process control block. Now, the first field is pretty straightforward. 
It's the process identification. Each job has a unique identifier, a unique code to distinguish it from other particular jobs. The next field we want to consider is the process status. Now every process is going to be in a number of possible states during its lifetime. It's going to be on hold, it's then going to be ready to run, then it's going to be running and we'll see later that it can also be in a waiting state. This is when it's running and it has to stop for some reason and move to what's referred as the waiting state so it can actually start running at a later point in time. So this field holds an appropriate code to indicate whether the process is in the hold state, the ready state, the running state or the waiting state. So the operating system can look at this field to discover which state the process is currently in. Another field to consider is the process stasis word. Now it's important to realize that although an operating system is software, it is controlling hardware and the hardware has special registers with inside the central processing unit. Now one of these special registers is capable of indicating what happens when a particular machine code instruction executes. So for example, if you add up two binary patterns and it produces a number which is too big to actually be stored in an appropriate register, the overflow flag is set to indicate, whoops, I've added up two numbers, but look, it's too big for me to deal with. An overflow is set, so the computer programmer would check for that and would say, oh, I need some more memory space to store this bigger number. So that's an example of why we have these flags. We can also have zero flags set. So if a zero flag is set to a one, you jump back to repeat some code. And if it's a zero, you don't jump back. Now this special register also has flags set to indicate an interrupt has occurred. So for example, a process might be in the running state, an interrupt comes in which says, I want to run a higher priority process. So the flags are set when a particular process is running. And what we have to do, we have to save these flags when we switch from a running state to a waiting state, because when we come back to a running state, all of these system flags, and all of the interrupt flags have to be reinstated because the process that was stopped from running will expect the flags to be set the way they were. Of course, when we go from a running state to a waiting state, something else will have run in the meantime, and that something else will be doing other things with these flags. So we have to make sure we're able to reinstate them when the process starts to run again. Typically, Central processing units can have a supervisor and a user state. And without going into too much detail as to what these are, the supervisor state is a special state that we expect the central processing unit to be in when it's dealing with operating system software, not user software such as Word and Excel and other programs like that. And there's a special S flag, which specifies whether the CPU is in a supervisor or user state. And this is something that has to be saved as well. Now we can see when we're in the running mode that this process status word is regarded as being undefined because it's using all of these flags. It's using the system flags, the interrupt flags, and the state bit, which says what the CPU is in a supervisor or user state. So the process status word is only really needed when you stop running because next time you run, you want to reinstate all of the flags as they were when the process was running. Because remember, when you go from a running state to a waiting state, a process is brought into a running state which will alter all of these flags. And when the process that was stopped running starts to run again, we want to bring all of those back. Now, I know I've just repeated that, but that's an essential thing to realize. We have to save the state of these particular registers. Another field is the register contents field. Now a central processing unit has data and address registers. The data registers are used to store the binary patterns that are being manipulated, i.e. added up, taken away, whatever you're doing to them. And of course the results of those processes are stored in data registers. The address registers point to locations in the computer's memory where you're going to get the data from or you're going to put the data in. So we have these registers inside the central processing unit. And when a process is running, it's continually using these registers. But when the process moves from the running state, we have to ensure that all of these registers 
have their environment saved. In other words, what's stored within them needs to be saved. Because when we return that process back to the running state, we have to go and get all of that data and bring it back to the data registers and the address registers. And that means that the running process that was stopped and then reinstated, as far as it's concerned, the data registers were never changed. The fact that they were changed by the other process that was running is neither here nor there because they were saved and then reinstated again. The main memory field is pretty straightforward. It stores the address of the job that's in the random access memory. The resources field stores information on the resources that are allocated to a job. For example, is a printer allocated? Which printer is it? They'll have their own particular codes to indicate which printer it is, whether a disk drive is actually being used, that type of information. Another field is the process priority field. Now, every process has a priority. Now, if one process is coming along and it says, I want to execute next, the operating system will have a look at its priority. And if the one that's currently executing has a lower priority, then the operating system could stop that one executing and allow the one with the highest priority to execute. But it needs to know what the priority is. Hence, there's a field to indicate what the priority of the job is. Now, we also have an accounting field. And this contains information that's to do really with performance measurement. So the operating system can look at its performance and report that back to the user, for example. So in other words, the CPU time used from the beginning to the end of the execution of a particular process, the time that was waiting for I.O. completion. These are just some of the examples. It's quite involved is the accounting field. So that just gives you a flavor for what it actually does. To summarize this video, we've looked at a job we've looked at a process and we can see that we have a whole state and then things are admitted to the ready state and when we consider the ready state we then have to start considering the process control blocks and we've looked at the fields associated with the process control block now the next video is going to carry on with this diagram here and it's going to have a look at what happens when we dispatch a process from the ready state to the running state and we'll have a look at all the other states that an individual process can be in. So over to the next video. Check out the supporting website for these videos and also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and get an automatic update every time I upload a new video. Also consider subscribing to the Google Plus Circle that relates to these videos.